Issa Rae is pretty fucking amazing. Like, I don't know if y'all really have conceptualized just how dope you have to be to get where she's gotten under 40 and all by herself, essentially. And some of y'all may not know that she actually got her start here on YouTube. If you're under 30 and didn't start consuming YouTube until maybe the last five or six years, you may not realize just how much of a endless void YouTube was in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Very few creators of this YouTube era are still relevant today with most either fading into obscurity with only a few still creating regular content. To date, the two biggest mainstream successes to come from YouTube are Donald Glover and Issa Rae. And Issa was pretty much a one woman show, writing, directing, editing, and starring an awkward black girl before connecting with Larry Wilmore and getting greenlit for Insecure, which is essentially awkward black girl with a bigger budget. Issa's not the first black millennial in her lane, but she's definitely the most prominent one. And as such, the show Insecure breaks ground on a couple of fronts. It's at once a millennial based drama slash comedy echoing the fears, joys, and angst of upperly mobile millennials settling into adulthood. And it's the first show of that nature with an all black cast and focus. As such, it was faced with the challenge of writing to the needs of its millennial audience, a group of adults saddled with, among other things, a greater sense of worldliness and self-awareness that many generations before us didn't have, which in turn meant that she would need to write these characters, specifically the men on the show, to be significantly different than anything we'd seen on the screen thus far. And if you ask me, she hit this challenge out of the park. So let's examine exactly what it is that Issa did so well and why Lawrence is the first man to have a fan club of heterosexual black men in this week's Black Movie Breakdown. Tragmatic. Insecure follows one Issa... Issa, Issa, shit, what is your last name? They have never said this on the show, Issa, okay. D, along with her best friend Molly, as two young professionals living in the Bay Area of California, navigating being young professional black women, seeking out self-love and money in modern day America. Issa fits effectively into the woman-child trope, being a pretty immature but incredibly lovable and plucky loser trying to pursue her passions and get her love life in order. Molly is the standard counterpart friend who's much better off professionally, but throughout the show has struggled mightily with relationships. There's an ensemble of other upperly mobile black folks as well as some great one-off characters, love interests, and a few cameos. It's, it's really good shit, y'all. Like, if you're not watching the show, you probably need to. I think upon reflection, like years from now, we'll be seeing this show in the same light as shows like A Different World, Living Single, and other black classics for millennials and Gen Z. At its core, Insecure is not a groundbreaking premise. Essentially, it's girls but black. What makes it special is its earnest effort to tell character-driven stories about black people that don't revolve around black issues, aka racism, poverty, you know, general mess. Things that white producers think a black show has to be about in order to be relatable to black people. Instead, it focuses on relatable human stories that anyone should be able to connect to just with an undeniable black tone that makes it extra special for those black viewers. Now, before I get into the black man on Insecure, because that's what this episode is about, it's important to first recognize that for the most part, these men are privileged compared to their counterparts in the episode from a couple of weeks ago. Insecure is a show written for and about upscale professionals coming from relative privilege and working white collar jobs. In isolation, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. The variety of black stories being told these days is one of the best things about black media. I bring this up though because I think it's important to recognize that the black men in media, the characters that I mentioned in the last video, they go through daily challenges and unresolved trauma and all kinds of shit that these characters from this show don't have a guy like OG Bobby Johnson couldn't go on a spirit journey while he's trying to find his son and make his way through prison. I think it's important to keep in mind that the whole idea of self actualization is at the top of a hierarchy of needs and that everybody isn't going to get there and everybody doesn't have to get there to be a quality person. Everybody isn't going to read bell hooks and Angela Davis. Everybody isn't going to go to undergrad at HBCU. And I think the world and social media would be a much better place if people were more reflective of this dichotomy and more accepting of the flaws and limitations of our own people. But let me get off my soapbox for a second. Insecure. 
Anyway, unlike the leading man in Fuckboys mentioned in part one, the man on Insecure are nuanced and despite being mostly side characters and maybe not even appearing in every season or sometimes only appearing in a few episodes, they manage to display images of black masculinity that just haven't been present in Hollywood. Take for instance Jared. Jared does have most of the markings of aspirational masculinity, but he's lacking the money, like he's not a high earner or overly successful, but he is attractive, he's good in bed, and Molly enjoys herself when she's with him. She also even tests his character by showing up at his house drunk, horny, and unannounced, to which he does the only appropriate thing to do in that situation. But later, when he casually reveals that he once had a sexual experience with another man, all of those clear markers of his quality, all the good things that he was up until that point are reduced to that one transgressive act in Molly's eyes. And her attraction to him fades almost instantly. She makes veiled attempts to reconcile what she sees and has experienced with this man versus what she has been taught to believe and expect from a straight black man. This is Molly's core arc in the very first season and it sets the tone that this show will not shy away from looking at patriarchy from different angles that other shows usually don't bother to, which is probably something that grabbed a lot of male viewers attention. And we pretty much never see how patriarchy negatively can affect a heterosexual man, especially a heterosexual black man. Of course, this is mostly because heterosexual men benefit the most from the system and write most of these stories or they either don't know or don't care, but it's still a thing to see and this moment was probably where I was hooked on the show because it showed me that I was going to see something different from here on out and that is a breath of fresh air. Another example is TSA Bay from season four. TSA Bay is what we like to call Fluffy. Works a blue collar job and is rather loud and a bit on the ghetto side. Somehow he and Issa connect, we don't see it on screen, but they just start there and they engage in a casual sexual relationship. The show actually gives this side character who looks like this two relatively graphic sex scenes with our main heroine. And although the scenes are partially played for laughs, they both subtly get across the message that despite the fact that TSA Bay is no Idris Elba, he is more than capable in the bedroom. I really can't recall too many instances where a black man who looks like TSA Bay is presented in a sexually competent and desirable manner. As a fluffy man myself, I know firsthand that this is the case in real life. In IRL, there's no shortage of love for large men, but because this image is so far from the masculine ideal, the truth of the greatness of men like myself is only known to the lucky few who have dared to love us. Then there's also Nathan who's a revelation in more ways than one. He, unlike a lot of other men in the show, is not a polished product. He's a barber with rough edges and seemingly bad habits in terms of communication. Then in season four, we find out he's bipolar, which is handled much differently than we often see black men with mental health issues. Typically on TV, if a black man has a mental health or substance abuse issue in a show or movie, he's foaming at the mouth or strung out or worse. The signs of the mental health issue are glaring and cartoonish and stigmatizing. We've seldom seen a black man address mental health issues like this, seeking help, being open with the people close to him, learning to live with a mental health problem like countless black men actually are doing in real life. It's very self-aware of how narratives about black people with these types of issues typically play out on TV. It purposefully sets up all the pieces of what you would expect from black drama and then subverts them. In a way, it often tries to deconstruct these types of tropes that are more typical of the genre. For example, even when the characters do fit the description of the typical leading man or a fuckboy, Issa still challenges the status quo in their depiction. Dro is the quintessential TV fuckboy, but he's also not, like at least as it pertains to how this character usually plays out on TV. Unlike most TV fuckboys, he never lies to Molly, and it seems pretty clear that he's not lying to his wife either. In many stories like this, the viewer learns to recognize a fuckboy because he's a liar and a cheater. A fuckboy is usually marked by disrespect, immaturity, and deception. However, Dro is completely honest and at least on paper respectful to both Molly and his wife. He is upfront about his open marriage and never with his words leads Molly to believe that their relationship is more than what it's supposed to be. In fact, he's very much safeguarded against his actual real relationship. This is significant because in real life, a lot of fuckboys use a similar tactic. They absolve themselves of the responsibility of their actions by being honest with their words, but not their behavior. Despite the fact that Dro constantly says the right thing, does the right thing, etc., he also consistently oversteps the boundaries that Molly tries to put up. 
He purposefully muddies the waters of their relationship by treating Molly like a girlfriend and not just a sex partner, which he knows is what she craves. He wants all of her affection and attention on his terms and on his time, despite her resistance. Even when Molly finds the courage to be direct about her need for better boundaries, he agrees and then immediately disregards them, forcing Molly to break things off. We see a similar issue with Daniel, Issa's what if God. He is honest and direct about his feelings and desires. He pursues Issa relentlessly and it seems like it should work, but Daniel's selfishness and insecurity bubbles over into his treatment of Issa, who, let's be honest, was not really all that into him to begin with, making this short dalliance relatively easy to end. But again, what's revolutionary here is how normal these men are. Daniel wasn't toxic or abusive. He was just not really equipped with what Issa needed and wanted. He was fine offering more support, but only on his terms. There are shades of toxic, which for a lot of people is much more real and relatable. It challenges the viewers to consider their behavior differently for the men watching, hopefully, but not always to recognize how their behavior is very similar to the characters they're seeing on screen. Good man down. As you all may have heard, the law has returned. However, let's cut to the chase. The entire reason why this video exists is because of one specific character, and that's one Lawrence Walker. If you ask me, Lawrence is probably the best written black male character I've seen in recent memory. And the reason for this is how well they've zoned in on a certain space of black masculinity that really hasn't seen much attention pretty much ever. But first I wanna address another elephant in the room and talk about the hashtag Lawrence Hive. So in my mind, there's two groups here. There's hashtag Team Lawrence, and then there's hashtag Lawrence Hive. Uh, insecure. Yeah. There, you were not supposed to. Were you not supposed to be on the show? Because I know you were. It was announced or insinuated mm -hmm. that when you and Issa Rae broke up, that you would potentially not be on the show anymore. And there was some kind of a, a movement to keep you yeah. on the show. Yeah. There were there were petitions. There was this uh, petition on this uh, this site called Care To. Uh, there were people protesting at at screenings in New York and in L.A. Like friends of mine would send me clips, and it was like, No Lawrence, no peace. I was up there like, No Lawrence, no peace. I got excited. I was like, Let's. And these aren't real things, but you know they are now after this episode, whatever. A lot of dudes see themselves in Lawrence, which says a lot about the state of black men. Team Lawrence folks see themselves in Lawrence, including his flaws and mistakes. They empathize with his weaknesses and insecurities and how they have contributed to his multitude of poor decisions. They celebrate when he does better and get frustrated when they see the opposite. But at the end of the day, Team Lawrence want him to succeed because in a way, his success is their success. On the opposite end, the Lawrence Hive, on the other hand, these cats seem to think Lawrence hasn't done anything wrong. They take criticism of Lawrence as criticism of themselves, and as such, refuse to acknowledge all the ways in which Lawrence is usually the architect of his own destruction at times. There's more to this, but the key here is that the Lawrence High folks basically use the existence of Lawrence as a way to voice their grievances against black women. And they can get very, very toxic. And also just miss the point. The greatness of Lawrence as a character is the opposite. So although I'm clearly planting my stake as a Team Lawrence guy, please don't group me in with these Negroes. It's, it's shades of gray and complexity. Just follow me for a second. We meet Lawrence in a depressed state of stagnation, having failed as an entrepreneur and currently failing as a partner to Issa, emotionally and physically. This right here is already significant because as a black college graduate, According to the tropes of black people on TV, Lawrence should already be rich. Like, that's all it takes, according to what TV says. If you a nigga and you go to college, you rich by the end of the third episode. Of course, we know that's not true in real life, but being an educated main character usually dictates that said character will not have money or employment issues because college fixes everything. As if college educated black men never have to lower their professional standards to survive or get off someone's couch. Furthermore, believe it or not, not all black men are sex machines and any man who is struggling with his confidence and his just sense of where he's going in life is bound to struggle sexually. 
So already we see an image that is pretty much non-existent on TV. Lawrence is despondent, unfocused, and depressed and pretty much just sucks when we first meet him. On the flip side, Issa is also providing some useful angles on how we typically view desirable masculinity. She isn't overtly intentional with it, but what she wants from Lawrence right now are greatly traits of classically masculine man, aggression, passion, maybe even a little violence. Okay, wait, are you guys fighting what? No, I wish. Sometimes I wish she'd just like slap the shit out of me out of angry passion. Not really, but kinda. These are the things that she's seeking in the moment. And let's be honest, do you think Lawrence has ever been much for any of these traits? It's pretty obvious from the tech skills and the general lack of smoothness as a character in most situations that Lawrence is a dork. That's what he and Issa bonded over. The aggression, passion, etc. These traits, they belong to Daniel, Issa's what if guy. The guy that represents all of the idyllic masculine traits that Issa feels like she wants, which is what makes her eventual infidelity kind of predictable. Here's Lawrence sleeping on her bouch, unsure and stagnant, while the Chad Daniel is independent in an aggressive pursuit of his dreams and Issa. Daniel appeals to that idealized image of masculinity that Lawrence has completely failed at. Again, this is relatable to a lot of black men who have seen Daniels in the world as the unattainable ideal. A lot of men know a Daniel. He's the guy she tells you not to worry about. The subtext of their difference is clear. Meanwhile, of course, Tasha pops up and a lot of men like Lawrence also have met a Tasha. She's the type of girl that you might cheat with to raise your spirits and affirm your manhood when you're feeling adrift. Tasha only sees good traits, often, and we'll get into this later, projecting that idealized masculine persona upon you. And you feel like that guy when you're with a Tasha, which usually in real life leads to infidelity on the man's part, but Lawrence doesn't do it. He takes a little bit of that feminine energy and adoration, like it's Tasha and not Issa that gives Lawrence the confidence to keep pushing towards his goals, but still he does do the right thing. He gets his shit together and rededicates himself to being a good partner, but by now it's too late. Lawrence is now adrift in pain and betrayal and like a lot of men is not really surrounded by the type of men who he needs to challenge him to respond to this pain in a healthy way. And so he does it. He enacts a pretty heinous, but in some way spectacular feat of revenge that Lawrence High folks were way too happy about. And here's really where the two camps differ. Watching Lawrence blow Tasha's back out was cathartic to a lot of men who've experienced infidelity or heartbreak and wish that they could have so callously concluded a bad relationship. Here Lawrence definitely appeals to a hypermasculine fantasy, but he also reveals the unspoken hurt that a lot of men feel but don't speak to in their failed relationships. And much like these men, Lawrence mostly acts out of pain. His next few relationships all suffer because of the flaws in himself that he is yet to face. Tasha is the quintessential rebound girl. Lawrence has minimal interest in her and uses her to provide the carnal pleasure he needs. It's probably his most fuckboyish move of the whole series and she poignantly calls him out on it. You don't think I knew what this was? I knew it wasn't nothing serious. But see, you front it like it was. Apologizing for shit you wasn't even sorry for. No, I was sorry. You, you a fuck nigga. Yo, come on. No, you know what? You worse than a fuck nigga. You a fuck nigga who thinks he's a good dude. This line from Tasha hits pretty hard because it's men like Lawrence that often go through life assuming they're the victim of the wickedness and cruelty of women never recognizing how their good guy persona is not real and that they're just as selfish and difficult as a typical fuckboy. They just don't have as many women throwing themselves at them. His other major relationships in the show indicate that he still has issues. He's insecure and unwilling to confront his problems head on most of the time. And he still, even at this point, doesn't fully listen to women. But at the same time, you can't deny Lawrence's earnest nature and the fact that his journey and difficulties in life are greatly a product of him trying to force himself into this aspirationally masculine image that just doesn't fit for him. Moreover, and here's where the team Lawrence and Lawrence Hive have synergy, one of his biggest problems is that the women in his life keep projecting that aspirational masculine image upon him and holding him to that standard. Tasha saw a college educated black man who was 
probably different from the typical guy she has access to. So she projects a lot of qualities upon him that aren't real. Aparna sees a talented and smart man with leadership potential and drive, and is when she realizes that he's still hurt and healing that she moves on. The most glaring example of this is Lawrence's threesome experience in one of the most interesting and low-key powerful moments of the show. At the time, Lawrence is very close to a low. Here, he's looking to party and connect with his friends as a way of recharging. Instead, he meets these two aggressive white women and they entice him with sexual escapades that really don't seem like Lawrence's style. But as previously stated, Lawrence is trying very hard to be this guy who he thinks he's supposed to be. And that guy would never turn down a threesome. However, these white women treat Lawrence the same way fuckboys often treat women. They denigrate him for not being the mandingo fantasy that they usually seek out and then discard him, which is something that white women do to black men way more than most people think. The sexual encounter leaves Lawrence feeling debased and hollow. It's fair to say that many of the women who get into relationships with Lawrence don't ever truly like him for who he actually is, but more so who they think he should be or could be. So despite his failings in these relationships, it's clear that they would have been doomed regardless. Deep down, Lawrence knows he's not that guy, but as far as he can tell, the only person that feels that way is him. Everyone else thinks he's Denzel Washington. It's not until he internalizes that it's okay for him to disappoint people's expectations that he becomes happier. Are you happy? Yeah, I think I'm getting there. You know, I used to think I had to be like the leader or the ideas guy, but I'm starting to realize like I'm happier executing somebody else's vision. Like I like being on teams. Really? Because you always wanted to start your own shit. Yeah, I think I, uh, I think I just thought that because I was supposed to. But, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm pretty happy right now. Lawrence also does something I've never seen a leading man do in a show of this caliber. He forgives a woman who cheated on him. Now, I'm sure there's some movie or show I can't think of where this also happened, but the way they do it here, the way they rekindle the Lawrence and Issa love affair is incredibly impressive because I feel like most of the fandom was over their relationship, even though they were hinting at rekindling it since the middle of season three. In just one episode, they completely got pretty much the entire fandom back on board by one, reminding us of their great chemistry and two, having them have one of the most grown up conversations about their feelings flaws and needs that has ever been depicted on screen. Lawrence asks some real ass fucking questions about the cheating and Issa responds with just grave honesty. He rejects the common rhetoric you'd likely hear from a lot of black men about how they would respond to infidelity and seeks out what makes him happy. He's honest with her and although not completely forthcoming about the fact that Condola is still in his life, but he still makes it known and he makes it Issa's choice whether or not she's ready to deal with him regardless of that glitch in the background. Their reconnection feels earned on both sides, not as if he's making a mistake. On some level, it does feel a bit rushed, like you wonder if Lawrence has truly matured enough at this point to fully be a good partner or if Issa is just leaning on another relationship in the middle of her breakup with Molly. But damn it if you don't root for them in the end, which makes the final gut punch of the season so much harder to take. Quick spoiler probably should have put that out there already i don't know after two episodes of pure black love we're hit with the bombshell that condola lawrence's ex is pregnant and is planning to keep the baby despite her and lawrence not being together despite them using precautions despite really lawrence making every appropriate decision to avoid this situation and even here lawrence's masculine identity is in turmoil He's now faced with a child he didn't plan for. In older episodes, he talks about how much he idealizes the marriage of his parents, and he clearly wanted that for himself. And now he's questioning again what kind of man he's going to be. Will he do the quote unquote manly thing, step up to responsibility and be a father, even in a less than ideal situation? Maybe try to work things out with Condola to attain the normative happiness that society approves of. Or will he seek what makes him happy, go with the only woman that ever loved him for who he really was? even if it's messy. Will Issa even want to be bothered with him? At the end of the day, Lawrence is at a crossroads that many men can identify with. It's not a crossroads of will he attain the aspirational level of masculinity, it's a question of what kind of man will he choose to be, flaws and all. It feels like all of these forces are pulling at him and he feels out of control in his own identity. It's a familiar space for a lot of black men. We're all operating off of the tools that were given to us and some of us are recognizing that a lot of these tools are broken and misshapen, maybe even toxic. 
So there's a lot of black men in his age range, a lot of aging millennials that are trying to figure life out, trying to figure the world out because it's very different than the one we were told would exist at this stage in our lives. You don't have to look like Lawrence to identify with this struggle. Lawrence is emblematic of Issa's willingness as a creator to craft stories out of relatable everyday life, to challenge her viewers to see more of themselves and her characters than most other black creators do. She also illustrates the struggles of a lot of men that are facing rapidly changing social landscapes as we begin to rethink and reform what manhood looks like to us. I'm not saying that this is the right way to write black men. I love Creed, I love Fresh, I love Atlanta. But I'm so happy that I get to reflect on how all of these black men illustrate a different part of who I am. And I'm so happy to see black men who are fly, fat, queer, corny, or dealing with mental illness given this type of effort, energy, and attention. Issa shows us that there's definitely room to expand that. But that's all I got for this one. I appreciate y'all watching. Peace. Yo, I want to just come on real quick as we can close things out. Um, I recorded the bulk of this before... Uh, we lost Chadwick Boseman. Um, I initially started to rethink, uh, you know, what I was going to try to put out, but I knew I wouldn't be able to create what I had in mind to kind of really reflect on, you know, the, the role he played, but I didn't want to let anything from my channel as small as it is come out without acknowledging, um, his loss and everything that he meant to the community. So uh, just one last thing, just RIP to Chadwick and um, peace and blessings to everybody and take care of each other. Peace.